Hello and welcome to Notre Dame Day, the global celebration of all things Notre Dame. What a beautiful day on campus. I'm Vahid Sadr a news anchor and reporter with ABC 57, the local affiliate in South Bend. And I'm Alex Wilcox, proud member of the Notre Dame class of 2016. I'm currently a reporter for WNDU-TV, the local NBC affiliate right here in South Bend. We're coming to you live from the Grojean Family Loft in the new Duncan Student Center here on the campus of the University of Notre Dame. And what a thrill it is to be my very first Notre Dame Day, Alex. Uh, yeah, welcome, Vahid. We're happy to have you. This is my third year with Notre Dame Day, my first broadcast was during my last semester at Notre Dame back in 2016, so it is great to be back. Let's talk about why we're here. Notre Dame Day is our annual celebration of everything Notre Dame. This is the fifth annual Notre Dame Day, a tradition that we started in 2014. Over the next 29 hours, yep, 29 hours, <laughs> we'll be talking with students, alumni, parents, friends of this great university. We'll make you smile, laugh, maybe shed a tear or two, but most of all, we will make you proud of the university we love. Notre Dame is the only university in the world doing anything like this. 29 straight hours of storytelling. And here's the exciting part. You're going to help us give away more, more than $1 million to the 900 student uh, organizations here at Notre Dame, academic units and athletic teams through your votes. And we're giving away w o over a million dollars in just 29 hours and you have the power to determine where this money is directed. You will decide with your vote whether it goes to your favorite residence hall, student club, academic unit, or athletic team. Your gift to Notre Dame Day earns you votes that you can make for any of the 900 entities on campus. The more votes each organization receives, the larger percentage of the money they will earn at the end of Notre Dame Day. Just click on the Vote Here button you see on your computer screen. It's that easy. And if you're watching this on Facebook Live and would like to vote, go to NotreDameDay.edu to vote. Five donors were kind enough to provide the money for, no, for Notre Dame Day, and we want to be sure to express our sincerest gratitude to them for helping us with this wonderful initiative. We'll let you know how the voting is going during each hour of the show, so go ahead and get started if you haven't already. To keep you entertained and engaged throughout Notre Dame Day, we've assembled an incredible show. You'll see and hear from more than 700 individuals, including musical performers, and some of the great Notre Dame names in professional sports, the business world, and entertainment. You'll also meet some of the most talented and interesting students, faculty, and staff on any university campus. You can find the entire broadcast guide at NotreDameDay.edu. Coming up later in the broadcast, we'll have live reports from the DeBartolo Performing Arts Center, where Irish singing sensation Chloe Agnew will perform, and the Chicago cast of Hamilton in American Musical will be performing in a concert from 7 to 9 p.m. Eastern Time. And at 9 o'clock tonight, the Fighting Irish 40 Championships will be run under the lights in Notre Dame Stadium. The men's division will include the two fastest players on the Fighting Irish football team. You can watch all of it here live at NotreDameDay.com. Uh, edu and d.edu coming up this hour we'll talk to a notre dame alum who is the former white house director of policy in the obama administration and now a director with the gates foundation we'll also visit with a professor of astrophysics who uses the world's largest telescopes to discover planets orbiting other stars we'll go on location to the hesburgh library and we'll go live to largo florida to visit a notre dame ace academy and there'll be much, much more. So stay right here. Let's head over to the Social Media Center for an update on the voting. Good morning. Hey, good morning, guys. Thank you so much. We're so glad to be with you. Thanks to everyone who's tuning in, everyone who has participated by giving and voting this year, the fifth annual Notre Dame Day. It just doesn't get any bigger than this. Duncan Student Center is amazing. Uh, if you haven't had the chance to come and see it yet, I encourage you sometime this summer, maybe reunion weekend, next football season it truly is amazing and you know we've had an amazing uh, year so far with Notre Dame Day we just crossed the 18,000 gift mark this is the big of it, biggest event of its kind in higher education uh, by a, a long margin and, and we're going to continue that this year so thanks to all of you who are giving and voting some updates on our hourly challenges. So a few hours ago, we had Endy in the community. I told you, impacting all sorts of local nonprofits. Well, uh, the ACE programs won in that hour. 
Again, ACE, in case you don't know, doing incredible work for Catholic education, uh, not just in the South Bend area, but all over the country and around the world. So congratulations to ACE, $500 in their hourly challenge. This hour, another very close area here on the leaderboard, this hour's hourly challenge is graduate schools. Uh, Groups, student groups, academic groups within our graduate programs, led by business on the front lines. 814 votes right now. They'd receive $12,000, almost thirteen, if the competition ended right now. That's transformational money for groups like this. Uh, the NBA Military Veterans Club, they started very strong with us last year. They're continuing to have an incredibly strong year this year. They'd receive $11,000 if the competition ended right now, along with the Business Analytics Club, the Chemistry Graduate Student Organization, the MBA Consulting Club, and MBA Women in Business. Thousands of dollars at stake with this year's $1.1 million challenge fund. Get online, give your minimum $10 to the university, and then cast your five votes for the areas at Notre Dame that mean the most to you. We're going to stay on top of the leaderboards all day, but the best way to get out there with it is with social media, Sarah. So what are we seeing? Well, you know, when some of us were in college, social media was not even a thing, <laughs> not something we could have ever even imagined. Of course, now it's part yeah, of it's our everywhere. everyday it's, lives. It's critical. And the folks who are doing the best with the votes are leveraging it's true. Every social year. media. So use that hashtag, ND Day. And you can show up here on our leaderboard, the social media leaderboard. Mm -hmm. We've seen the Alliance for Catholic Education, mm -hmm. College of Engineering, Challenge. College of Science, and each year. And folks around the broadcast are posting shots of themselves here on the set, and it's just a lot of fun. It's so exciting. Anyone can do it. The Club of Stewart, Florida, has continues to have an amazing year this year in Florida. Any club, any group, get out there on social media, start asking for those gifts and votes. We'll see you back here later on this hour for now. Let's send it back upstairs. Thank you, guys. Suman Data is the Freeman Engineering Professor in the College of Engineering. Now, recently, Professor Data and his team at Notre Dame were selected to lead a foundational multidisciplinary research center that will share $26 million in funding to expand the growth and leadership of the U.S. semiconductor industry. Now, their goal is to invent the next fastest computer processor. Suman, welcome to Notre Dame Day. Uh, first, for uh, those who may not be familiar with semiconductors, such as myself, uh, can you explain uh, what semiconductors do and how they kind of impact our lives? Definitely. So many people don't realize that semiconductor is one of the most powerful invention by humans. A recent poll suggested that semiconductor ranks about fourth in the list amongst all inventions by human mankind, wow. right behind electricity, printing <laughs> press, and penicillin. So semiconductors form the core material that goes into any electronic product that you and I uh, use in our day-to-day -day lives. And that goes from your Fitbits to your smartphones to your personal computers to your flat panel displays and on and on and on. Uh, also, semiconductor turns out to be the third largest manufactured export by United States. So it creates a lot of jobs at home mm. and it fuels a lot of innovation in our country. So it's a very uh, powerful material. Yeah, I had no idea it was uh, it was so important. Also, we have to say congratulations to you on uh, on the research grants of the new research center. Can you tell us a little bit about the research center and why uh, it can really help the research that you're doing? Definitely, we are totally psyched and totally excited about this new multidisciplinary and multi-university research uh, center that we are leading uh, at Notre Dame. And uh, the main uh, focus of our research center is to address these fundamental challenges that are associated, associated with semiconductor scaling. You know, many of you guys are uh, enjoying the enormous advantages of having a very powerful computer <laughs> that you can carry in your, in your pockets today, and that's enabled by semiconductor. There are challenges because you can't split atoms. So the foremost goals of our center is try to understand these fundamental roadblocks and do innovations at the materials level, new device level, new circuits level, and new architecture level to actually get past those red brick walls and, and, and go forward. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a research center that is f sponsored by a joint public and private partnership. So we have the United Department of Defense, which is DARPA, mm -hmm. putting in money to support this research, as well as we have all the leading U.S. semiconductor companies that are also putting in about 50% of the research money. So we are greatly excited to work with this, with this joint public-private uh, uh, partnership. 
Yeah, Notre Dame seems to be really a, kind of leading the charge here. But as you said, there are so many other partners that are uh, helping you guys out in all this. Yes. So we are the lead institution, but we cannot carry this burden. This is a tremendous burden to carry uh, in, a, in a good way. So we are actually joined by uh, 12 other universities. So starting from the West Coast, we have the University of California schools, including Berkeley and Stanford. Uh, we have uh, folks from the, the mountain part of the country, Arizona State and University of Colorado. From the Midwest, we have Notre Dame, Purdue, and Minnesota. And then uh, as we move to the East Coast, we have Georgia Tech and Cornell, who are helping us with this enormous R&D effort uh, so that we can break through those red brick walls and continue with <laughs> semiconductor scaling. Wow, just uh, incredible work, of course, uh, led by you and, uh, and Notre Dame, but really interesting to hear about how this is, uh, this is a nationwide effort to get this done. Uh, Professor Suman Dada, one of the uh, leaders in the semiconductor research field, thank you so much for joining us on Notre Dame Day. Now let's send things back over to Vahid. All right, thank you so much, Alex. Our next guest is a Notre Dame alum who is a director of U.S. policy, advocacy, and communication for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Prior to joining the Gates Foundation, Rob Neighbors was the Chief of Staff at the U.S. Department of Affairs, Veterans Affairs, and previously the Director of Legislative Affairs and Deputy Chief of Staff for Policy in the Obama Administration. Joining us on the Notre Dame Day video hotline now, Rob Neighbors. Rob, thanks so much for being here on Notre Dame Day. Thank you for having me. Rob, tell us about your work with the Gates Foundation, if you will. Well, the Gates Foundation is an organization of about 1,600 people, and I'm responsible for coordinating our policy, our communications work here in the biggest market uh, that the foundation has, the United States. Uh, in addition, I do work in Canada and Mexico as well. What are some of the pressing concerns you seek to take on in your role? Well, at the end of the day, the, the mission that Bill and Melinda have given everybody at the foundation is really to, to, uh, to take on the biggest problems that the world is, is facing um, without regard to sort of historic roadblocks. So right now, the, the, the main issues that we are focused on are eradicating polio, trying to find a, virus, uh, a vaccine for HIV, trying to improve the U.S. education system to ensure that uh, all kids, regardless of economic background or ethnic background, have an equal opportunity for education and to ensure that uh, women around the world all have access to equal health care and equal employment. Well, Rob, prior to this role, you worked in the Obama administration, notably as the director of legislative affairs. Tell us a little bit about that role. Many opportunities to uh, to excel in that type of role. There, it, it's really a unique position and at a unique time where the the position is always a position where you're sort of caught between two worlds. Where to be effective, you need to be convincing to the to the Hill, but you also need to be convincing to your colleagues in the White House. And the president always joked that to the extent that people both on the Hill and the White House are yelling at you, you're probably doing something right. That is the nature of the position. Well, I'm sure there's some challenges as well you had to overcome in your White House role. Can you tell me one of the biggest ones that you had to overcome? Well, the, the biggest challenge that, uh, that, that I really faced when I was in that position was with regard to sort of the, the, the economic recession that the United States was in at the time. And there were two issues in particular. One was uh, getting the economic recovery package passed and through Congress. It was the biggest, the biggest stimulus package that the country's ever passed. The second was probably more challenging, which was trying to negotiate a debt ceiling increase for the United States. The, the ramifications of not getting that debt ceiling increase uh, passed would have been devastating for the U.S. economy and for the global economy. And up until the last second, there really was some questions about whether there would be the votes in Congress to get it done. But at the end of the day, due to some, some hard work on both sides of the aisle and, and with the White House, we were able to get both of those things accomplished. Yeah, and I'm sure your Notre Dame education has come up quite frequently in your connections. What, how has the Notre Dame education benefited you in the policy work you've been involved in up to this date? Well, there's a couple of things. I mean, one, I, I really did value my time at Notre Dame in, in terms of the, the breadth of the education that I was able to, to follow. Um, most of the public policy issues that I either worked on in the White House or that I currently 
work on uh, at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, there's not a, a single uh, a single solution to this. So you have to bring a multidisciplinary approach to it. I think the second thing that really stuck with me from my time at Notre Dame was just a, a service mentality that being in public service, being uh, in a philanthropy, what we're really here to do is to try to help people who need uh, help the most. And that was something that was really in it was indoctrinated into me when I was at Notre Dame. It's something that I carry with me uh, into my, my work as, as well. Rob Neighbors, thank you so much for joining us and being a part of Notre Dame Day. Thank you for having me. We'll be right back after this short break. The kids in our ensemble are from incredibly diverse backgrounds. We have kids who are at risk. We have kids who are the children of Notre Dame professors. But all the things that could divide them disappear when they step on stage. Caesar's ambition, which swelled so much that it stretched the sides of the earth. Christy Burgess is the founder of the Robinson Shakespeare Company, a theater group at the University of Notre Dame's Robinson Community Learning Center that serves children from all parts of the South Bend community. It's kind of hard to think about a 15-year-old, you know, black girl from the Midwest connecting with a 16th century Elizabethan bard. But love, sadness, grieving, death, murder, they happen every day. About some half hour hence, pray you speak with me. For this time, leave me. You shall at least go see my lord aboard. I had a lot of struggles with, like, depression and stuff. I really didn't think I was going to finish high school. And now I feel like I have more infinite opportunities to be able to get into a college and graduate. In the summer of 2017, the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust invited the Robinson Shakespeare Company to England to perform at Shakespeare's home and walk in his footsteps. At Notre Dame, we're committed not only to teaching Shakespeare, but also to use Shakespeare to transform people's lives. Shakespeare's more than just a book on a shelf. His work endures because he gives us a way to learn how to live. You've not heard you say, love's reason without reason. For many of these kids, there's not a safe place in their lives for them to step out and take risks and be vulnerable. Through Shakespeare, they're able to do just that and turn it into something beautiful. The University of Notre Dame asks, what would you fight for? Fighting for Shakespeare for all. We are. The Fighting Irish. Welcome back to Notre Dame Day. I'm Alex Wilcox. Joining us now on Notre Dame Day is Justin Krepp, a professor of astrophysics in the College of Science who develops new technologies and observational techniques to detect and study planets orbiting other stars. Back in 2013, Krepp was awarded a NASA Early Career Fellowship and in 2017, he won the NSF Career Fellowship for his research at the Large Binocular Telescope. Justin was recently selected for the National Academy of Sciences Committee on Exoplanets. Justin, welcome uh, to Notre Dame Day. Thank you for joining us. So to start, just uh, I don't know a lot about science, to be completely honest, but explain what is an exoplanet and why are they kind of important? Right. It's, you know, it, it's a planet orbiting a, another star. Basically, we have eight or nine planets in our solar system that are all going around in the same direction, depending on whether or not you count Pluto. <laughs> um, and there are many other stars out there. There's 400 billion just in our galaxy, so that's the Milky Way. And then there are trillions of galaxies. And so we're trying to find other worlds orbiting other stars because we think that's the most likely place where you could potentially develop life. Hmm. And uh, what we found so far is something like a fifth of all of those stars have planets around the same size as the Earth and around the same roughly approximate distance in the sense that they might have a reasonable climate. And so, you know, the, the goal of our research is to try to, to seek and search for life and to see if it might be uh, similar to our own. Wow, wow, very interesting. Uh, very quickly, do you consider Pluto a planet? I, I do not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry. Uh, you know, it has a funny orbit and it doesn't really control what's going on out there gravitationally. It just happens to be uh, the biggest ice ball 
that's beyond uh, <laughs> Neptune is one way of thinking about it. Okay, sure, fair enough. And well, I understand that you also design and build instruments for use with some of the largest telescopes that are out there in the world. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so I mean, Notre Dame has access to the large binocular telescope and the and Keck Observatory. So that's um, Arizona and also. Uh, on the top of Mauna Kea in, in Hawaii. Those are some of the biggest telescopes in the world, certainly the biggest in the northern hemisphere. And you can think of a telescope uh, kind of the first order as a light collecting bucket, but what you do with that light afterwards uh, depends on the science that you're trying to accomplish. And so we divert the light to various instruments. We try to take images, we try to record spectra, we do various things to manipulate the light and uh, really uh, attempt measurements that have never before uh, been made. Wow, okay. And now uh, you're also the director of the engineering and the design core facility. Can you just explain that a little bit and that, how does that intersect with your work? Right, so there's a, there's a group of, of professional engineers that uh, we just hired and established this a few years ago. Um, we service the, the entire College of Engineering, the entire College of Science and all the departments within. If you're building a custom instrument we can help you with the designs, with the procurement, with the testing, with the integration, uh, with the delivery, whatever it is that a principal investigator doing world-class research needs. And so uh, we have engineers that are mechanical, uh, electrical, uh, optical, systems engineering, uh, control software, you name it, basically complex optoelectromechanical systems. We can build almost anything uh, again, not just in astronomy, but to enable these measurements that have never before been attempted. Wow. And now uh, I'm going to ask you to predict the future a little bit here. But if you had to guess, what would you say is the next big thing in astrophysics that people should be on the lookout for? So just last week, there was a very important mission that launched from Cape Canaveral, Florida. It was called TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. It's going to find Earth-like planets around stars that you can see at night. You're going to know the address of all of the locations of worlds that could potentially hold life. And we're building instruments to make follow-up measurements to uh, get the mass and the radius of the planet and figure out what it's made out of. You get the density, you can imagine, you can start to figure out, is that a, is that a water world, is that a rock, sure. is it a big gas giant? And so we're trying to infer those properties around the closest uh, stars and the closest planets in our solar neighborhood. Wow, really quickly, do you think there's other life out there? I do, I think it's inevitable. I think at least simple life, whether uh, it's intelligent and how you define intelligent is another question, but I think there's just so many opportunities to, to, to roll the dice, if you were, uh, with, with that many stars and that many exoplanets that I think it's just a matter of time. If, if, that's just my opinion, though. Sure, sure. But a uh, very, very well-educated opinion. And thank you so much for joining us on a Notre Dame Day. Certainly when you talk about the billions and trillions of stars out there, it makes you feel a little more small. But that's all right. Justin, thank you for joining us. Now let's join Ryan Harris at the Hiller Family Midfield set. Ryan. Thank you so much, Alex. Our next, next guest is another champion himself from East Brunswick, New Jersey. He's earned All-American and Academic All-American honors. And last month, he added the words national champion to the resume as a member of the Fighting Irish fencing team. Jonathan Fitzgerald, thanks for joining us, Jonathan. Thanks for having me. So let's talk a little bit first. Take us back last month, the NCAA championships, the last second win. Walk us through it. Yeah, no, it was it was a there was a tense atmosphere for sure um, going into the tournament. A lot of people didn't really think that we were uh, the favorite to win, but um, that really helped us and fueled us. Um, so once it happened, it was just an overwhelming feeling. The entire team was there, had driven out to, to Penn State to cheer us on, and it was just it was an incredible feeling to have that repeat national title. What though the odds? And you mentioned <laughs> the repeat, you know. In the championship world, we all have reverence for those who do it back to back. Yeah. What did it take? How'd you do it? I mean, for us, it was like, especially going into this season, we had the target on our back because we had won nationals the year before. So we knew that everyone was going to be coming for us and they were going to be hungry. Um, but so we decided we'd stay hungry and be like one team, work together, go to practice every day, work hard. Um, and we had a few stumbles, but then when it came down to it, we all like put put our work in, put in, got went, got together, and uh, just won it again, and it felt great. And I hear your weapon of choice is the saber, or mm -hmm. some may call yeah. it the sabre, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, how did you come to pick the weapon? Um, so I started off with foil, which a lot of fencers do, um, 
but Saber's the most aggressive weapon out of the three. And I, when I was fencing foil, I, my coach said, all right, you're way too aggressive for this. You should go to Saber, try it out. And I loved it. Um, and then that just took off for me ever since. And it was a great, it was a perfect match for my personality type. What an awesome thing for a coach to say, hey, you're a little too aggressive. Here's another weapon. Yeah, right? yeah, but exactly. that's, you said, some personalities choose different weapons. Yeah, yeah. No, it's based on a lot of, they're really different um, styles. They're really different uh, techniques and everything. You can't really interchange between the two. Um, so once you get one, you're sort of committed to like that like style of weapon. Um, so Saber for me was pretty perfect. It's like fast paced. Uh, you have to think on your feet really quick and that's like how I like to do it. So it was good. It was a good choice. We've been talking for a couple minutes. My personality, what weapon would I fit? I think, uh, I think you'd probably be Saber too. I think you'd, you wouldn't like the Epe and Foil. Probably a little too slow for you. I feel like you'd like the fast paced changing of distance and that kind of stuff. Hey, well, I appreciate yeah. that. Fast paced changing <laughs> difference. Now we got a shot here. This is Arguably my favorite shot I've ever done in broadcasting here. <laughs> this trophy's incredibly heavy. We did a little workout before we got in. <laughs> Us Notre Dame people, we work out a little bit. I was doing a little push press. You're doing the bicep curl. You know, yeah. champions never stop working. Yeah, but never stop. This thing is heavy. You know, yeah, no, you know it is. it's really amazing when you win a championship to actually hold that trophy. Oh, I yeah. did so at the Lombardi, but... What did it feel like to put this in your hands for the first time? It was awesome because uh, once you get the trophy, I, the entire team comes up and then like we all were like holding the trophy up together and like I was kind of like underneath it. So it felt really cool to just like have my hand on it, like, you know, for the second time too. Yeah. And, and when you have two of them, they're both pretty heavy. So that's uh, definitely a workout to do too. Absolutely. Yeah. And then how did you get started in fencing? Um, so I played a lot of sports when I was growing up. Like I played basketball, soccer, baseball, and I just hated them all. Like I would... We would, when I, I would cry when I wouldn't get the ball or like I would do really well and we would lose like I'm, like I just kept not wanting to go to practice um, and then I tried all these individual sports too like um, taekwondo and tennis but I just nothing really stuck and then I used to run around the house with like wrapping paper rolls like pretending to fight bad guys when I was little so my mom said okay you seem like you might like something with fencing and things like that because she saw a local ad for uh, a, a club in the area so I went and I tried it, and after my first day, I told my mom, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And then, like, we took off from there ever since. Well, congratulations. Last question real quick. Part of the reason why we do this and why we're so unique as athletes at Notre Dame is we go beyond the sport. We were talking a little bit. You've got some interesting studies you're doing and work that you do. Why don't you tell the people? Yeah, so um, I study Arabic and peace studies, and I'm a senior. So after graduation, I'm going to be working for Booz Allen Hamilton in Saudi Arabia. I'm working on military and defense consulting, and it's kind of the perfect blend of everything I've been studying, um, what I wanted in a job, so I'm really happy with it, and I can't wait to start. Well, congratulations, Thank champion. You so Salam alaikum. Well, alaikum. And now Salam. we're going to kick it back to the library with Jen. Jen, what do you got going? Thank you, Ryan. I'm here on the sixth floor of the Hesburgh Library in the University Archives. And the University Archives preserves the and stewards the most important holdings from the university's history, including the collections of the late Reverend Theodore Hesburgh. And we have Angela Fritz, the head of the University Archives, and Charles Lamb. He's the senior archivist for Photographs and AV with us today. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining us. They're here to tell us about the Hesburgh Portal, which is a new website that provides online global access to these historic collections. And Angela, before we get to talking specifically about that, um, can you tell us a little bit about the mission and the holdings of the University Archives? Sure, Jen, and welcome to the University Archives. The archives serve as an important component to the specialized holdings of Hesburgh Libraries and also serves as a cornerstone to explore the history of the university since its founding in 1842. With over 47,000 linear feet of material, the archives serve as the institutional memory for the university, and our collections provide the larger research community with a historical lens to explore the evolution of Notre Dame, its place in higher education, and its place in history. And can you tell us a little bit more about the significance of this collection? Absolutely. The signif significance of Father Hesburgh's collection and the Hesburgh portal is that it focuses on a unique chapter in Notre Dame history, the life and legacy of Father Theodore Hesburgh. The portal assembles the sights and sounds and writings of Father Hesburgh around an interactive storyline that engages visitors with digitized materials from his collection. Charles has actually pulled some physical artifacts from Hesburgh's collection to show us today. Thank you. Yep. Um, I pulled out three photographs first. The first one is the family portrait of, father, of, the, of a young Father Hesburgh, along with two of his sisters and, and his mother. 
The second photo is the iconic photograph of the 1964 civil rights rally in Chicago, where Father Hesburgh appeared with Martin Luther King, Jr. The third is a, a photo of Father Hesburgh on campus with three students who were involved in student government. Um, I also have three AV items here. First is a, is a record album of a 1953 speech that Father Hesper gave at a fundraising dinner in New York. The second is the 1987 commencement. And the third is a film of Father Hesper fishing on, on vacation with friends. And Charles, now I understand that people around the world can see this online. Exactly. Um, if, if you go to the, the portal, you'll see that the web page starts with uh, chapters. There are six different chapters from uh, early years to um, civil rights era, and then under the chapters, there are stories, such as the Civil Rights Rally of 1964. Under the, under the stories, there's text first based upon archival research and augmented with photos and graphics to help tell the, the story. Each story also has a photo gallery with relevant photos to the topic of, of the story. <clears throat> and there's also a document gallery, which has documents from correspondence to speeches to telegrams. And then <clears throat> there's also a media gallery, which shows um, media pieces associated with Father Hesburgh and his life and legacy. And the last element is uh, Father Hesburgh's speeches. They can, there's a page where they can be searched full text, and they can be read. So that's a short view of the, the portal. Very cool. I can't wait to check it out myself. And Angela, why is this just such an exciting, exciting experience for the university? The Hesburg portal is exciting because it not only showcases the impact that Father Hesburg had on the university, but also showcases his influence on social policies on both the national and international contexts. But probably most importantly, the Hesburg portal showcases the personal connections of Father Hesburg, as he touched so many people in compassionate and important ways throughout his life. The ability to be able to share Father Hesburgh's legacy with people from around the world is exciting, and the portal also represents the future work that Hesburgh Libraries and the Archives will be doing. Thank you, Angela and Charles, so much for joining us. I'm going to send things back to you guys, uh, Vahid, in the studio. All right, Jen, thank you so much. And joining us now is Notre Dame Professor Gerard Powers. Professor Powers specializes in the ethics of the use of force, religion, peace building, and U.S. foreign policy. Here at Notre Dame, he's the director of Catholic Peace Building Studies, and he's also the coordinator of the Catholic Peace Building Network. He recently participated in a conference at the Vatican titled Perspectives for a World Free from Nuclear Weapons and for integral disarmament, and he's here to chat with us on Notre Dame Day. Gerard, you have a very interesting and currently relevant field of expertise. Good morning, and what, you, morning. what got you into the field? Well, what originally got me into the field was I was a Jesuit volunteer, uh, and I decided that I wanted to work for the Church on Peace and Justice. I came back to Notre Dame for a theology degree and a law degree, and then I worked for 17 years with the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, as a foreign policy specialist working on a range of issues related to ethics and U.S. foreign policy. And then well, I came, been here since 2004 when I joined the Crock Institute. Well, Notre Dame is strengthening its global uh, programs. How does the Catholic Peace Building Network engage with the church around the world? Well, we were founded in 2004 and we're headquartered at the Crock Institute for International Peace Studies, which is part of the new Keough School of Global Affairs. And this is one way that the Keough School and the Kroc Institute uh, connect what we do in our research and the classroom with some of the world's most pressing problems. So, for example, we're doing, we've been doing a major project with Georgetown Boston College and the U.S. Bishops on nuclear weapons. Uh, and we've also connected with the Catholic Church in several regions of the world where some of the world's most intractable conflicts are, have been fought. And the Church is playing a very important role in those conflicts as a peace builder. Uh, so we work specifically with uh, the Vatican, um, about half a dozen bishops' conferences, uh, numerous university institutes like our own at Georgetown and Boston College and elsewhere, and then ca with Catholic Relief Services and other development agencies. And my job, uh, our job here at the Notre Dame, is to find ways that these different Catholic institutions can work together uh, on promoting peace in some of these conflict areas. 
Well, we know here at Notre Dame, faith is a very critical part of the education. You talk about the importance of faith and religion as it relates to peace building and nonviolence. Talk about yeah. that. Well, you know, especially since 9-11, there's been a, a lot of focus on religion, but it's mostly been on the negative role that religion plays in, in promoting division and conflict and violence and terrorism. And, and that's part of the story, but we want to tell the other part of the story, which is about the positive role of religion. And the Catholic Church in places like Colombia and the Philippines and Congo, where we've been working, is a major force for peace. Uh, it's mostly, un, and it's mostly unheralded and unknown. And we're trying to map and, and do research on that, but also work with the church to help strengthen its capacity to be a peace builder in some of these regions. Well, let's talk a little bit about the recent nuclear arms related conference you attended at the Vatican. Can you tell us what that was all about? It's a hard job, but somebody has to do it. Um, we, uh, we were fortunate that a dozen of uh, five faculty members and a dozen recent and current students, mostly current students, uh, were invited to this major Vatican conference. And normally students are not invited to conferences like these. It's diplomats, senior church leaders, and the like. Um, but we were invited. We all got to meet personally with the Pope. Um, and we also got to meet with most of the 11 Nobel Peace Prize winners who were at the conference. So it really was a, a, a terrific opportunity for us to do something, especially that students, but even faculty, don't often get to do. And this was a major, probably the most important Vatican conference on nuclear weapons since the Cold War. And the Pope uh, issued a major address condemning nuclear weapons and calling for nuclear disarmament. And it was just a privilege to be part of that. You spoke about the, uh, the students a little bit. Can you speak yeah. about how that conference will help them professionally, academically, here at Notre Dame as well? Well, most, both the students and the faculty alike you know, said that this was you know, not only the most important experience they've had since they've been at Notre Dame, but even some of them said in their whole life, this is just one of those memorable experiences, especially meeting the Pope. Um, but it's had some very practical consequences. One, one student told me last week that because of contacts she made at this conference, <clears throat> she just got a prestigious internship at one of the best uh, arms control organizations in Washington, D.C. Um, almost all the students that participated have done academic, academic presentations at one of a half a dozen events we've had on campus on nuclear weapons since the Vatican Conference. Um, and. <clears throat> and the students helped us just last week, helped us welcome Beatrice Finn, who is the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize winner, uh, to campus. And she gave the, uh, Hesburgh, the annual Hesburgh Lecture here on campus just last week. So it's had a very practical benefit to students, and they've been running with it. They've been taking what they learned and, uh, and running with it. Professor Powers, thank you so much for being here. Okay, thanks, thanks for having me. Yeah, you're watching Notre Dame Day 2018. We're going to be right back after this short break. On March 8, 2014, while riding my snowmobile, I hit a hole in the ice, was thrown 80 feet through the air, and suffered a cervical 5 spinal cord whiplash injury, rendering me an incomplete quadriplegic. When you're suddenly paralyzed, one of the first thoughts that goes through your mind is, will I ever walk again, and will I ever be normal? Walking becomes an obsession, every step forward momentous, and when you hit a plateau, it can be devastating. At the University of Notre Dame, Professor Jim Schmiedler is using robotic analysis to help individuals with spinal cord injuries learn to walk again. Individuals with spinal cord injury have difficulty in how they use their hip and knee joints to absorb energy on each step. Our robots face similar challenges. By using tools from robotics to model human locomotion, we can better understand the deficits these people must overcome in relearning to walk. In collaboration with neuroscientist Michelle Basso at The Ohio State University, Professor Schmiedler is helping validate downhill training, an innovative technique to help individuals who had plateaued in their recovery. Jim's work in robotics has been critical in helping us improve therapeutic techniques for people with spinal cord injury. His engineering expertise is bringing a whole new perspective to our team. This research has the potential to have a real impact on people's lives. 
My hope is to help all those who have stalled in their recovery. These people have overcome tremendous hardship, and we don't want them to just get better on the treadmill. We want to improve their quality of life. The University of Notre Dame asks, what would you fight for? Fighting to walk again. We are the Fighting Irish. Welcome back to Notre Dame Day. I'm Alex Wilcox. We're joined now on the Notre Dame Day video hotline by Keith Galley, the principal of St. Patrick Catholic School in Largo, Florida. Now, St. Patrick is one of 15 Notre Dame Ace Academies. Keith and St. Patrick schools were recognized at halftime of the Citrus Bowl in Orlando when Notre Dame played LSU. And they've used that opportunity to build support for a new STEM classroom for the school. So, Keith, thank you so much for joining us here. Now, tell us what makes a Notre Dame Ace Academy unique. Well, I would say one of the big things that makes being a Notre Dame Ace Academy unique both here for us at St. Patrick's and all the other Notre Dame Ace Academies is really the opportunity to collaborate with each other, the other school leaders, where we get to share best practices and have problem-solving sessions. And then also a lot of our schools are very small schools where we only have one of each grade. And so our faculty has the opportunity to articulate with other faculty members across Notre Dame Ace Academies and collaborate with them both, and especially here in the Tampa Bay region with Professional development, doing classroom visits and retreats. Another big thing that's really important for us is that we have a shared mission and that core values throughout the network. And so all our students have the goals of college and heaven. And then our shared values of seek, persist, excel, love, and serve allows for shared resources amongst all our teachers and staff members that we explicitly work on teaching these core values to our students through our morning gatherings, our values-based lessons, and our school assemblies. And then I would say the last really big thing is the availability of resources that we would not necessarily have easily as accessible with curriculum materials, grants, and exposure for marketing and recruitment for our schools as we work to grow and make ourselves available to as many students as we can. Now, I know ACE plays a, a big role in, uh, in your school there. What is Notre Dame's, though, day-to-day -day role at St. Patrick's? So I have uh, two people from Notre Dame that actually work here at the school several days a week. Christina Badman, who is our regional director of school culture, and she works with professional development for the faculty and then also works in helping keep those lines of communication open within the network. And then we have an advancement director that really helps us with marketing and recruitment and being able to get out into the community and make those connections and help bring families into the school. Yeah, now, uh, if you can, of course, school is all about the kids. So tell us a little bit uh, about the kids that you guys serve. Absolutely. So we have a very diverse school population here. So we have right now about 175 students. We've grown about 20% over the last two school years, a large part of that happening this year with being in Notre Dame Ace Academy. And then right now, about 75% of our students are Catholics. However, a large, we've had 10 students over the last two years that have been baptized into the faith, which is a great sign of the evangelization going on here at St. Patrick's as part of the Notre Dame East Academies. About 80% of our students qualify for the federal free and reduced lunch program. And about 90% of our students get some sort of financial aid in order to be able to attend here at St. Patrick's. In terms of demographics, we have about 35% of our families are Hispanic, 15% African-American, 10% multi-ethnic, and then we also have some from Pacific Islanders. And then we also have multiple refugee families from Africa and the Middle East here as well. So wow, really, right uh... now we're really working on our growth as a school and our population. And as we do that, we're accepting more and more students that maybe not have had the same academic exposure and opportunities that we expect our students here at St. Patrick Catholic School to have. And so while many people would see that as a challenge, we really look at that as an opportunity to help support those students and their families in an environment that allows them to really become the best possible person that God created them to be. And I understand you guys have a, a pretty ambitious project that you guys are uh, trying to make, trying to build a, uh, a STEM classroom. Can you describe that for us from the student size and what new experiences will your students be able to have as a result of this STEM classroom? Absolutely, so we all know that children are born with a natural inclination for exploring, for creativity and questioning. And all the research shows us that a lot of times that really starts to um, fall apart as they get into school. 
and this will this STEM lab will really give students here at St. Patrick's the opportunity to have a space where they can learn, they can take risks with it, with that safe environment where failing is not just an acceptable thing; it's an expectation that they do as they learn. And so, while the equipment is definitely necessary and a very integral part of this classroom, and I'll talk about that in a moment. The STEM classroom is really more about the process of learning that's going to take place for the students and then having the ability to take risks to really get out there and see what's available to them. And so with many of our students, uh, they don't have the opportunity to have this exposure to the technology at home. And so really giving them that opportunity to see what's out there as they work as, and prepare for college and the workforce after that. So some of the opportunities that we're going to have within the STEM lab is we'll have the opportunity for students to take virtual field trips. This really gives students an opportunity to engage with experts and environments that realistically, there's just no other way that they could do that. And, and so the, these opportunities are out there and we'll have the equipment to make that possible for them. As well, students are going to have the opportunity to engage with computer coding projects, 3D printing, engineering activities, and robotics using different kits that will be purchased for the space and curriculums. Um, one of our root beliefs here at St. Patrick Catholic School is that we are unique and valuable. And this really stems from the fact that we believe we're all created in God's image and likeness. And in order for us really to truly live out this root belief as a community, we have to make sure we're giving our students every opportunity to explore what the world has to offer them so they can really build upon those unique gifts that they've been given by God and then be able to use them and take them with them after they leave here at St. Patrick's to continue to evangelize and make God known, loved, and served within the greater community. Absolutely, Keith. Thank you so much for joining us on Notre Dame Day and, of course, our very best to the students at St. Patrick's School. Well, let's Thank now send much. things over to Michael Roday. Welcome back to Notre Dame Day. I'm Michael Rodeo, one of Notre Dame's most popular student-run traditions began in 1990 with the student-led creation of an annual custom-designed TV t-shirt sold at the Notre Dame bookstore with proceeds benefiting charity, and 2018 is no different. I'd like to welcome members of the shirt committee to Notre Dame Day. Give us your Notre Dame introductions. Hi, uh, my name is Kristen. I am a junior science business major and I live in Walsh Hall. Great. Hi, I'm Irene. I'm a freshman computer science major and I'm in Walsh Family Hall. Hi, I'm Gray. I'm a senior. I'm science free professional major and studio art minor and I live in Farley Hall. Awesome. Awesome. Irene, talk us through the process of producing the shirt. Who decides what color it is, what goes on it, that sort of thing? So the color is actually the first thing we do, and it's a committee-wide decision. We look at things such as the home game schedule and previous shirts to make sure we're doing something different. Right. Then we really start deciding over winter break. And the goal is to get as many designs out there and just get feedback, see what resonates with the committee. Then we, get, we come back here, and we sort of meet to decide the direction we want the shirt to take. And then we just go through hundreds of iterations. We send out designs, ask for opinions, make changes, get feedback. And we, every Wednesday we meet again, get more feedback, make more changes, and it goes on and on until we find the one that we, the design that we really think is the one. Awesome, Kristen, could you, hold, could you hold up the shirt for me? Do you have one? Yeah, absolutely. All right, great. Let's let's uh, let's take a look at this and uh, tell us the, the story behind this design. Yeah. So this year, one thing we really wanted to do is focus on tradition. You know, focus on the idea that it's not only college students wearing it; it is everyone, all ages, fans, alumni, um, even the babies this year. <laughs> so um, on the front, we. We really talked about um, we wanted to kind of do a throwback to like the green jerseys um, of the Joe Montana days with mm -hmm. the um, gold lettering and then on the back we really um, did a tribute to Eric Persigian with his quote um, we have no breaking point which is really important for the whole Notre Dame fan base and team because and that ties in with our um, off or our goal line stance and awesome. um, yeah so it's just kind of more than just a goal line stance you know we also it's the whole Notre Dame team, no matter what point it is in the game, we all stand united, and that's absolutely. so unique to Notre Dame. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so Kristen, tell us about the unveiling celebration. This is always a big deal on campus, yeah. so give me a sense of what goes into this and, and what happened right. this year. 
So it's really the culmination of a years long of hard work for our committee, and mm -hmm. it's really an exciting day for us because we've been in secrecy since October about the color and the design, and it's finally when we get to show the world um, what it is, and it's a awesome. really anticipated event on campus. So we have everything ranging from student groups and performance groups who come in from the bagpipe team to the jump rope team. <laughs> awesome. Um, and then this year we are very lucky to have a special guest, Jalen Smith, come help Coach he Coach Kelly unveil the shirt. Great, great. So, so um, this is a this is a charity, right? And Correct. so, Kristen, um, where do the proceeds of this sale of the shirt go, and uh, where can they buy it right now? Right. So one of the things that's really amazing about our project is since 1990, we've made or raised over $11 million. And all wow. of that money has stayed on campus to benefit students. So we are, are created by the students for the students. And the money really goes to support student clubs and organizations and also students who are in need of extra funding so that they can have the full Notre Dame experience. Fantastic. OK, thank you for joining us on Notre Dame Day, guys. Um, and uh, make, uh, as, as always, go Irish. Now let's send it back to Vahid in the studio. Vahid. All right, Michael, thank you so much. Appreciate it. And joining us now here in studio, uh, the Coyle Professor in Literacy and Education and Inaugural Director of the Center for Literacy Education in the University of Notre Dame's Institute for in Educational Initiatives, Ernest Morrell. He is joining us here this morning. Thanks so much for being here this thank morning. A uh, little bit of background about Professor Morrell. He's an expert educational theory, English education, and African diaspora, popular culture. And here's today to talk about uh, his work at the new Center for Literacy Education. Thanks so much for joining us again. Oh, great. It's great to be here. Thank you. So talk about, about the new Center for Literacy a little bit and this literacy education is all about. Sure. I mean, what we're trying to do is basically improve literacy outcomes for our most vulnerable populations um, in schools. Like, we know that literacy outcomes change life outcomes. So a kid who is more literate is more likely to get a better job, they're more likely to be healthy, they're more likely to stay out of trouble, they're more likely to be useful to their families and communities. And we've been able to move the needle in terms of literacy achievement over the last hundred years. Take the late 19th century. Very few people in the population were literate. By the end of the 20th century, almost everyone could read or write. But in the 21st century, reading and writing is not enough. What you need is not the basic literacy, but you need an advanced level of literacy that's going to enable you to participate civically and uh, professionally. And what we realize is that um, there are many populations, whether they're in urban centers or rural centers or in other countries where there's not the infrastructure, they're not getting that quality education. So we're trying to bring the best research to practice to inform what happens in those places train teachers and leaders so that we can what we have, call what we want um, equitable excellence for all students. Well, let's talk about the impact that you think yeah. the new Center for Literacy and Education can have. Oh yeah, well it's great that we're here at Notre Dame, we're connected with the Institute for Educational Initiatives and the Alliance for Catholic Education. Um, just this year um, we have been on the ground with 10,000 teachers and school leaders helping them understand what are research best practices, right? Um, what can you do like tomorrow to improve outcomes in your literacy classroom? What kind of questions should you be asking? So we're trying to have an impact in terms of the basic research, like what do we know about schools that are effective with educating all their kids, right? We also want to be um, helpful in training leaders and training teachers. So we train teachers here um, through the Alliance for Catholic Education. We train leaders through the RIMIC program for educational leadership. But we're also working with uh, teachers out there in the diocesan school systems and the public school systems that think differently about their practice working with the South Bend schools here. So we want to change the way that, um, that they think about what they're doing with kids, the way they think about um, how they connect with families and communities, um, change what they think is possible for all kids. The impact we can have is to raise literacy achievement for our for our, our, our struggling students, but raising that achievement also means changing communities, it means changing the American economy, it means people are much more likely to be able to practice their robust faith tradition, so it's nothing less than changing the world. You change literacy, you change the world. Well, I can see the passion that you yeah. have. You, I can see the passion you, that you it, have. It's only it. been a quarter century, right? <laughs> Just tell me a little bit about literacy. Yeah. What does the initiative mean to you personally to lead this initiative here at Notre Dame? Well, to lead it at Notre Dame is, is special because I have the opportunity to work with wonderful colleagues like Father Tim Scully, who directs the uh, Institute for Education Initiatives. Um, I have wonderful colleagues in the English Department and the Africana Studies Department. But to lead the initiative for me at this point in my career, um, it's a chance to leave a lasting impact. I was in Dallas yesterday with the teachers, and I said, um, if you teach a fourth grader how to read, you change the life of that fourth grader's grandchildren. Right? So, the, so, so the, 
the legacy is um, I want my grandchildren to know nothing about a, a racial achievement gap or a gender achievement gap. Um, to, to know that regardless of what your parents do for a living, you're going to have a literacy education that would allow you to be a CEO or president of a major country. The impact we're going to have is to change conversations on the ground about what it means to teach kids, what it means for kids to learn, and what it means for them to be successful. Well, final question for me is you, you came over from another university here to yeah, Notre Dame. Yeah. Why Notre Dame? So as you know, Vahid, I was at Columbia University, right? And I was directing an institute there, um, and I was, a, I was a professor. And I came to a point in my life where I had passed all the barriers. You know, I was sure. an endowed chair professor, and I was directing an institute, and I really began to think, what do I want to do with my life? And I was invited by Father Tim Scully to uh, form a partnership with the Alliance for Catholic Education. And I realized that, you know, for the first time in my life, I could marry my faith tradition with my academic work, right? And I wanted to be at an institution that leapt the bar in terms of research productivity, but also leapt the bar in terms of having a mission that was uh, consistent with our Catholic values. So being here at Notre Dame allows me to do that, um, you know, allows me to be involved with cutting edge research with amazing colleagues, but it also allows me to, to live a fully Catholic life and um, to be committed to our most vulnerable Catholic schools domestically and globally. Professor Morrell, thanks so much for Thank joining you, us pleasure here. pleasure to be here. Thank you. Let's send it over to our social media center now for an update mm -hmm. here this morning on the voting. Hey, thanks so much, everyone, and thanks again for tuning in wherever you are around the country. If you're on the West Coast, maybe you're just waking up with us. Thanks to everyone who's made Notre Dame Day 2018 another historic year in its fifth year. It's the biggest event of its kind in higher education. If you haven't done it yet, we're reminding you again, make that minimum $10 gift, cast your five votes. Graduate schools are this hour's hourly challenge. We have a ton of challenges uh, this year, especially even just social media challenges that you can check out on our website. I have an update, the Forever Domer Challenge. Uh, Liam at Liamosity18, he won one of our social media challenges, uh, and he selected an AOI to receive an additional $200. So congrats to them. And if you want to drive even more challenge fund dollars from our $1.1 million challenge fund, uh, you can go online, notredameday.nd.edu. Quick check at the top of our leaderboard here. Some interesting stuff at the top. I didn't think this was going to be possible, but the Air Parsegia Medical Research Fund is in shooting distance of overtaking St. Ed's Hall for the for the top spot in the overall leaderboard. So this is going to turn into a competition. The men of St. Ed's, it's time to start digging deep. Call, it's time to start calling those relatives, and it's time to start activating those networks. Same thing goes for the Parsegia folks. It's going to be really interesting towards the end of the day. Sarah, what's happening in the next hour? Well, we have another great group coming up. We've got Declan Kiber from the College of Arts and Letters, Jim Small, a legend from where I grew up in the middle of Michigan, Lindsay Meyer, Times 2017 Person of the Year, Dally Duffy, of course, Executive Director of the Alumni Association, and then John Handrigan, Head Coach, Men's Golf. Oh, so, so a nice group. Amazing. So much more ahead. We'll see you at the top of the hour in just a few minutes. Much more of Notre Dame Day 2018 coming up right after this. An Irish blessing. May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face and the rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. We are the University of Notre Dame. The world needs a university that educates men and women who accept their responsibility to serve others. We will strive to build a community where education, inquiry, and faith combine to respond to the demands of justice. This is our goal. Let no one ever say that we dreamed too small. If a seed planted in dirt 
can one day preserve a species or cure the sick or resurrect a people withering economically. We dream of what a seed planted in the mind and heart can one day do. The mind, it processes every image, every voice, every word on the page. Yearning to understand, inspired by faith, it paints a picture of the world. When given the chance to examine things from different perspectives, to turn conventional thought upside down, the mind soars. <laughs>